Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Gilmore here, managing partner at Barker Gilmore. Um, I'm just going to give us a minute or two as people are just look, coming on. I, I'm watching the count uh, exponentially go up. So I just want to give a, a minute or two before we start, just to get everybody set up here. Um, appreciate everybody showing up today. I know how busy everyone's schedule is, and everyone's schedule seems to only be getting busier these days. So just one more minute, and then I'll... I'll get us going. So I, I get the easy part of the job. I get to do the kickoff here at the beginning. Um, today's webinar, Doing More with Less, Managing Work and Developing Talent with Ever-Tightening Budgets. I think it's a great topic that people are constantly asking about. Um, and one of our favorites, Maureen Brundage, has put together a really terrific panel. Um, the one thing I think is great about this panel is we often are hearing how People do things differently at large companies and small companies. So we have a great uh, Christy here from a Fortune 1000 and Cam coming from uh, a Fortune 50. So we get to see how it's done on both sides. So I think it's really terrific. Um, again, I'm John Gilmore. Our team here is responsible for placing general counsel, chief compliance officers, and the strategic hires that they make. So we build these departments. And then on the coaching and, and advising side, our team of esteemed former Fortune 500 general counsel and chief compliance officers do a great job of coaching and advising, helping people develop their skills to make them as effective as they possibly can. Um, today's webinar is complimentary. It's part of our GC Advantage program. Uh, feel free to check out our website. You'll see that this program will come up um, where you can click on the link. So if you don't get to stay the whole time or if you know friends that missed it, um, about three weeks from today, it'll be showing and you'll see our previous um, uh, webinars on that site as well. And then uh, coming up on June 16th, we have Building, Mentoring, and Coaching Diverse Teams, um, our next uh, part of our GC Advantage series. So don't be afraid to, uh, to uh, sign up for it and show up for it. People are complimenting regularly that the, the, the guests on the show really bring a lot of value to them. So take a look at that. And then as far as questions go, um, we do reach, you can add questions at any time through the process. We'll try to get to some of those questions as we go along. If you see a question that you really want answered and somebody else already asked it, feel free to give a thumbs up or something along that line on, on that question so we know there's a lot of interest and we'll try to get to that. If we don't get to it during the program, we're gonna leave about 10 minutes after the, uh, so about 10 minutes before the hour, we'll address some of those questions. And then the questions we don't get to, we'll try to post the answers on our, on our website. So all that said, I will introduce Maureen Brundage, uh, former general counsel of Chubb and partner at White and Case. Uh, Maureen is incredibly full of stories and advice to give, and she does a great job. So welcome, Maureen, and thank you so much for putting this together. Thank you very much, John. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today and to have these great pa panelists I'm delighted have joined us. I'm going to keep the intros brief. I encourage you all to look at the impressive bios that are available on the webpage for this webinar on the Barker Gilmore website. You can learn more about uh, all of us. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Cameron Finley. Cam is Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of Archer Daniels Midland Company, a Fortune 50 global agricultural business with uh, revenues of 70 billion and 40,000 employees worldwide. Prior to joining ADM in 2013, Cam was GC of Medtronics, a medical device company, and prior to that, Aon Corporation, the global insurance and human resources firm. He also was a partner at what is now Sydney Austin, as well as having a really distinguished career in government service, including serving as Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor. So Cam, thank you for joining us. I have Christy Marigola is also with us. She's Senior Vice President, General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer and Corporate Secretary of the Hain Cholesterol Group, which is a leading organic and natural products company. Its revenues are 2.5 billion and has over a thousand employees worldwide. Christy joined Hain Celestial in 2017 as Chief Litigation Officer and Chief Compliance Officer, Chief uh, Litigation Counsel, sorry, 
and uh, then became GC in 2016. Prior to that, she held various in-house roles at Avon, the beauty company, and prior to that was an associate at DLA Piper. So welcome, Christy. As John indicated, I was at Chubb for uh, 10 years. Uh, Chubb had, at the time, had revenues of $14 billion, and we had about 10,000 employees worldwide. Uh, my team included about 60 lawyers worldwide. Uh, CAM uh, has a team of, I believe it's 75 lawyers worldwide, and Christy has about 10 lawyers worldwide. So as John already indicated, it's intentional that our experience is varied, the sizes of our company and the sizes of our team. So hopefully that will give you different perspectives during today's discussion. So let's get to the doing more part of the title of the webinar. Historically, I think work demands on legal departments are always increasing. And during the pandemic, legal departments had to deal with um, unexpected and unforeseen issues such as employee safety, regulatory matters that were unforeseen, contract and supply chain issues, and cyber threat threats, just to name a few things. So not surprisingly, I think most GCs and most legal departments saw their workloads increase during the pandemic. There have been numerous surveys that have been conducted during 2020 of general counsel by various organizations. The results were somewhat similar, so I'm going to refer to them today collectively uh, during our discussion. So according to those surveys, more than 70% of the GC surveyed so work, saw our workloads increase during the pandemic and expected that to continue through the rest of the year. I'd like to see what the audience that we have listening today, uh, what your experience has been. So that brings up our first polling question. So for 2021 compared to 2019, i.e. before the pandemic, uh, the workload in my legal department is substantially higher somewhat higher, about the same, somewhat lower, substantially lower, or not applicable, you may not be part of a legal department. So while we're waiting for those results, uh, uh, Christy, I'd like to just start with you and get your experience during the pandemic on your workload and what you see for the rest of the year. Sure, and thanks, Marie. Thanks for having me today, and good afternoon, everyone on the phone. Um, I think our workload was su substantially higher during the pandemic, and I think the pandemic brought a whole host of issues, some of which you mentioned, that our legal department hadn't faced historically. So in addition to our daily workload, we were now dealing with pandemic-specific issues. We were dealing with how do we keep our employees safe during the early stages of the pandemic, whether they be um, working in manufacturing facilities around the world. We are an essential business and have been operating throughout the pandemic. And to even to today, as we're now evolving and returning to work, dealing with issues with respect to return to work, um, issues around vaccination policies, and then all the other issues in between. So dealing with supply disruptions, ingredient sourcing, um, issues with government regulations that differ, not only differ nationally, but differ with respect to each individual municipality. So we saw lots of challenges, particularly around COVID specifically. The other challenge was just having a corporate um, infrastructure all remote. And I think that brought a whole host of challenges that we've never experienced before. There were more decisions made um, in silos. And so people were not seeing or having the face-to-face -face connectivity. And so there were a lot more emergencies. Um, folks are spending a lot more time on Zoom and, and Teams calls during the day. So the amount of work um, you know, was exacerbated because of all the meetings that had to be scheduled instead of short kinds of um, you know, hallway conversations that could resolve lots of issues everything had to be a scheduled meeting or phone call. So we found that you know, there were certain decisions that legal may have been involved in if we were all together in the office that we were not involved in and we had to account for those things in more of an emergency kind of situation. And then we're just finding that the daily workload is, is that much more intense given the additional layer of the COVID related issues, but also some of the challenges of working remotely. All right, thanks. Cam, uh, what's your experience has been? Uh, you know, I, I would echo many of the things that Christy said. Um, you had the normal workload, of course, but, um, but then there were things like uh, uh, when a, a customer would claim force majeure, how do we respond to it? We'd want to make sure that 
we didn't respond to it in a way that would that would be inconsistent with uh, how we might uh, uh, take a position if we were on the other side of that, because not only it's a supplier supplying us, but we're uh, supplying our customers. Um, uh, all the the pandemic related issues from the beginning, we too are an essential industry. Um, we had to seek and obtain injunctions in some countries to continue to keep our plants operating um, because uh, uh, some, uh, some countries didn't distinguish between essential and non-essential employees. Uh, we had to deal with, uh, we've been dealing lately with issues of, of the vaccine, uh, whether, uh, you know, when our employees would be eligible, uh, whether to mandate the vaccine, what sort of incentives can we give them uh, can we uh, make distinctions in the health insurance program based on vaccines? And, and then the latest is as, uh, as uh, the economy begins to reopen and people are coming back to our offices, as you can see, I'm in my office and we're, we're really pretty much in the U.S. back in, in offices. Um, uh, we have uh, made the decision that you need now wear a mask if you're in a, an office like this and you're farther than six feet from anyone. Um, but the question has arisen, what about in a meeting room if you're at opposite ends of the table? And what does OSHA say about that? What does the CDC say about that? Um, we've even had some crazy issues. We, we make ethanol out of corn and um, ethanol is an alcohol and alcohol had a sudden uh, increase in demand because of hand sanitizer. So we had to deal with the regulatory issues of whether ethanol could be used in hand sanitizer. And we, we successfully were able to, um, uh, the ethanol that wasn't being put into gasoline tanks and cars that weren't driving around, we were able to sell to the people who were making hand sanitizer. So I think our workload, I don't know if I'd say it went up substantially, but I would have, we're not allowed to vote, I guess, but I, I was about to vote. I would have said it's gone up somewhat. Um, they're not, uh, not, uh, uh, not a dramatic way, but there's just some issues we never had to deal with before. Okay, so with that, let's see how everyone else voted. Can we have the polling results? So as you, um, a 70, uh, rather 70, 48% so were for the workload substantially higher, somewhat higher was 39%, about the same as 5%. Uh, and no one saw lower uh, and a very small amount not applicable. So uh, I think consistent with what both of you have experienced. So let's now delve into the with less part of this webinar title. You know, legal department budgets, I think, have always been tight. And I would have thought with the pandemic, uh, it would have made the situation even more difficult with budget cuts, uh, hearing about companies having issues and cutting budgets and perhaps having layoffs. And this was the case for some, but uh, not necessarily for all. According to the various surveys that I had mentioned, um, just under half reported budgets, their budgets were cut. And perhaps even more surprisingly, almost the same amount had budgets increased. A majority did not experience or anticipate staff layoffs uh, and a, but a small percentage did have some layoffs. And again, perhaps surprisingly to some, um, some in fact expected staff increases. Um, so this brings us to our next polling question, which logically is, uh, if you could bring that up, which is uh, for 2021 compared to 2019, my legal department budget has increased, decreased, remained about the same or not applicable. Uh, so while we're waiting for that, Cam, what, what's been your experience in terms of your budget and your staffing? Uh, our experience really has been uh, kind of steady as she goes. Um, uh, you know, I, I would think that if we're, one were in the hospitality industry or the cruise ship industry or the airline industry that the pressures would be really intense, but um, uh, we had we had a, a, um, a, a very good year last year because even as some of our businesses, the the parts that um, serve restaurants and the food service industry uh, experience challenges, um, uh, we we make food ingredients and particularly kind of um, uh, food ingredients made out of corn and soybeans and, and wheat. So uh, 
uh, the way we put it uh, is during the pandemic, people flocked back to the center of grocery stores. They were buying pastas. Uh, Kel our, our customers like Kellogg's and General Mills had record years last year. So um, uh, we really had kind of a, um, a, a decent year um, moving commodities around the world and selling them to our, uh, processing them and selling to our customers. Um, while our work changed a little bit, went up, as I said, in certain areas, it, it didn't go up in, in any area that would have justified you know, hiring a, a new FTE to handle you know, ethanol, hand sanitizer, regulatory issues. Uh, so uh, I, I think we really are pretty steady for the year. Okay, Christy, what's been your experience? Yeah, our experience is similar. We also have the good fortune of being, um, as I said earlier, essential business. We are in the health and wellness space. And so in terms of consumer preferences and areas where consumers are um, focusing during the pandemic, our products were, um, sold very, very well. And so the work inc increased, as I said earlier, we've been in the fortunate situation where we really by and large haven't had to cut across our organization. So we haven't experienced significant um, you know, budget cuts within the legal department. I would say that the areas where we're spending money may have shifted a bit. So um, our company is also going through a, a transformation during the same time as a pandemic. And so we're shifting our business strategy and evolving some of the things that we're focusing on as a legal team. But by and large, I think overall, the budget is fairly consistent with where it was in 2019. I think people are taking on incremental work related to the pandemic and that's spread throughout the organization. But our hope is that at some point this will come to an end. So it really did not justify bringing on new additional people to deal with pandemic specific related issues. Okay, great. Can we have the polling results and let's see what our audience experience has been. So um, from the audience, about 44% indicated their budgets remained about the same, 35% uh, had their budgets decrease and 11% had their budgets increase. So uh, a bit of a varied view there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, if you if you are faced with a request to cut your budget, uh, or you want to ask for more budget, uh, more ask for more to be added to your budget. You know how should one go about doing that? Um, I, sometimes the old adage about if you don't ask, you don't get is really good. That sometimes you have to speak up and push back and perhaps ask for more. But there are political ramifications of doing so that you do need to take into account and you really need to pick your spots. You can't always be the one saying, okay, no, not me, and we're an exception, and you know, GC is different from that. So really think about it. And I also encourage you to uh, talk to some of your colleagues, because sometimes the business people can be very helpful when you either want to avoid a budget cut or if you need budget uh, help. I had a situation when I was at Chubb, a very large compliance project that I wanted to undertake and was struggling to figure out how I could fund it out of my budget. And in having conversations with the chief administrative officer, he really proved instrumental in helping me come up with uh, a, basically a, a plan uh, and a strategy to sort of sell to the uh, executive committee and to the whole organization, having the corpor corporation pay for it and not having it to come out of my budget. So coordinating with him and talking to him really proved helpful to me. Um, Christy, do you have any pointers on uh, either asking for more or pushing back on cuts or anything that could help our audience? Yeah, I mean, my experience is similar to yours, Marie, and I think it's invaluable to have folks on the business team that see the commercial benefits of having a strong legal department and a strong legal budget. I think um, the communication is really important. So I, I really do appreciate the feedback and solicit the feedback frequently from my business partners to understand where they need legal support and where they find our um, help to be most impactful. And then use that to really leverage the position of the team within the organization. I think it's helpful for legal to be part of those commercial conversations so that you can anticipate some of the areas and timing of issues as they're going to come to fruition. And so we are prepared to deal with them as a legal organization and not a bottleneck. And then I think it also helps with respect to getting the support for additional resources if you need them 
to know where those areas um, are where you know legal has either been a delay or an impediment to getting a business decision made because of some timing issues, right? So to the extent we need extra resources to support a particular project or a function, if we're able to anticipate what those are and get the support of that business team, it's quite helpful in ensuring that we have the right resources to, to assist with the project. I think on the compliance side, it's helpful for people to really understand the risks and also understand what the benefits are to the organization of putting forward a new particular um, initiative or a new program and understanding why the company should incur those costs as a, a cost center and um, you know, a cost to the company. The legal team, I think, needs to be more affirmative and proactive in terms of soliciting the support and explaining the reasoning behind some of the budget so that there are allies within the organization that very much see the value and so that you have the support when it comes to budget time. Right, we used to joke that the executives would not look good in orange, so that was yes. a good reason for them to fund compliance. <laughs> Cam, how about you? What suggestions do you have for folks? You know, uh, the one, one thing one when, thing I, when I, I came to ADM, yeah. I really struggled at the beginning to convince my colleagues that we ought to expand the size of the internal department. Because we, we had a model where we had a very small legal department and we used a um, massive amount of outside counsel. Um, and so if you looked at it as a totality of costs, we, a lot of the, the money was not really visible to the, the businesses. They, all, they saw the, you know, the small group of lawyers we had here and they said, why do you wanna you know, add a few lawyers? So I, I actually created a chart, actually a set of PowerPoints because it keeps going uh, piece by piece of an iceberg where the, the tip of the iceberg was the internal department. The, back then, the 15% or so we were spending on in-house counsel. And the part below the water, of course, was the 85% that we were spending on much more expensive lawyers and outside counsel. So I said, you know, you think you've got a legal department of 50 people. You actually have a legal department of 1,500 people. You just don't know who they are. Uh, you never see them and you're paying too much for them. So if you can give us more in-house people, we can take a chunk of that iceberg off. And if you uh, give us the technology, which we're going to talk about later, I know, uh, I can carve another piece off. And if we do all these things, you know, the, the key is not to attack the little piece of the iceberg sticking out of the water. It's to attack the part of the iceberg that's invisible to you. So that was one device I used. And I think, you know, business people don't know much about the legal world and they don't pay a lot of attention to us sometimes. And I, I don't think they understood that we were spending all this money on outside counsel. Um, I, I think I would echo what uh, um, you said, Maureen, and Christy said also, that it's critical to get business uh, support before you ask. I think, uh, you know, an example is we had, uh, we were spending a lot on trademark, um, outside trademark lawyers. and I went to our CFO and I said, you know, we're spending X, we can hire one guy to do this. And we, we can do it for a third of the cost. And so that was easy. He became an ally. Um, if we have a, a new region we're going into to talk to the regional head, you're gonna need a lawyer out there and have them be the one that asks for the resource. I think um, uh, having someone other than the general counsel ask for lawyers is often the most effective way to do it. And it's ultimately about Developing trust, I think that if you if you ask too often, they'll think you're an empire builder, and if you ask only when it's necessary, they'll know that when you ask, it's really necessary. Right. Yeah, I think it's important, and Christy alluded to this, knowing uh, how well your team is doing and uh, having a sense of who's working on what, uh, how busy people are or not busy on busy they are, their ability to take on more work. Uh, and making sure that you're prioritizing the work, focusing on the work that really will drive the business and the strategy of the organization, as well as uh, addressing the risk in the organization and not working on things that are low risk or really not important to the uh, organization at all. In my early days at Chubb, we did um, a, a project that we brought in time tracking for like a month period. And, and I hated time tracking when I was in private practice doing diaries, but it really was a worthwhile exercise to get a handle on 
what people were really spending time on and to be able to analyze and look at um, what work really they should be spending time on, what work they should uh, delegate down to perhaps lower people, uh, administrative staff in the department, and perhaps what work shouldn't be done at all. One thing that came out of it is um, people were spending a lot of time on non-disclosure agreements. And when I asked like how much litigation did we have on non-disclosure agreements, I was told none. So I said, well, I think we're definitely spending way too much time on that. So finding ways to uh, change that and to be that you're not spending valuable resources. So I think it really is important for you to make sure you're focusing on the stuff that really uh, is important to the business and really supports the strategy of the organization as well as it addressing risk is important. Uh, consider using resources uh, creatively, whether it's uh, having people that have a background in something that they can go and help out in employment matters, or whatever it may be, to look for where you have the ability to move people around. Um, and I encourage you, including those who are not general counsel, if you have suggestions of you have ways that you think the department could run better, your team could run better, the company could run better, uh, discuss it with your managers, with the general counsel, with others. Just because something has always been done one way doesn't mean it's the best way and doesn't mean that people have thought about it. So do uh, look for opportunities to make suggestions and to raise your hands. Cam, any additional thoughts on that? You, you said almost verbatim everything I was going to yeah, say, which is, uh, I except that I never tried. I've never tried time tracking. I, I don't want to uh, be drawn and quartered by my lawyers. But <laughs> I think it's it really is important to take a critical look at everything you do, and ask, as you said, um, is there anything we can do uh, uh, in a different way? Is there anything we can have somebody else do it that's cheaper than the way we're doing it? Is there anything that we do that really you don't need to do at all? And I'll tell you a story that uh, Andy Zopp, who is the general counsel at Sears, some of you may know Andy, and she, um, she spoke to my lawyers when I was at Aon, and the example she gave was that at Sears, um, you know, there would be, those of us old enough to remember, there would be a weekly insert in the Sunday paper, and they had a number of lawyers who did nothing but check every word and every price in that weekly insert every week. Uh, it was very time intensive. And she thought, let's try an experiment. Let's not do that for a few weeks. And she stopped doing it and lo and behold, never had an issue. If a price was wrong uh, and someone came to the store, they would resolve it, either say something like, sorry, that, that was a mistake. Uh, and, uh, or they would uh, give them that price and keep the customer happy. But ultimately they decided they didn't need to do that anymore. So I think we should all look very critically at, our, our, at what our lawyers do and ask, do they need to be doing it? Can a paralegal do it? Can you offshore it to India? Uh, uh, or should we just stop doing it altogether? And Christy, anything to add? Yeah, my experience is similar. We recently started um, not time tracking, but on a weekly basis as a department, highlighting what the individual priorities were for each team member, and then working collaboratively to figure out if those were the right priorities for the organization. And I think it gave us good visibility into the fact that certain members of the team were working in a silo and prioritizing their own agenda items, but not really appreciating how their work impacted the broader organization. And what we've been able to do is as a group decide, okay, well, these are the things we're going to prioritize and need to happen to the extent that somebody's underutilized on the team, there might be an opportunity for them to do a cross, uh, cross functional or cross discipline uh, collaboration give them a professional development opportunity, but also take the workload off of the person on the team who's extremely stretched to make sure that the priorities that we're focusing on collaboratively are the right priorities for the organization. So we just started this process um, getting after getting the feedback from our organization that people were really stretched and that there were things that we needed to stop doing as an organization in order to be more effective for the things that were really the highest priority. And I think it's working well. It's giving us as a group more visibility into all the different projects the team is, is working on. And it's also giving me the visibility to be able to say, well, that's really not worth your time. And I'd rather you focus on this particular item. And we need to collectively as a team ensure that this gets done. 
So it, it's not as far as the time tracking. I agree. I'm sure that's very helpful, but I believe that that might have some negative implications on morale, protect, particularly when people already feel so busy and stretched. But I do think it's good to have the visibility and the communication and just ensure that you know, from a commercial perspective, going back to the prior conversation about getting the allies in the organization, that we as a legal team are focusing on the right things to support our commercial business as well. Right. So let's focus, and, and Cam already uh, alluded to this, is uh, a big part of our budgets are always outside council spending. And we're going to talk about technology in a minute, but even without technology, there are various things that you can do to try to better manage outside council spending. So, for example, you know, billing guidelines and uh, engagement letter templates. Uh, we did this and had versions for both U.S. outside the United States, had them available electronically to everyone in the department. Uh, uh, claims were separate from general counsel at Chubb. Uh, claims had preferred counsel lists and uh, negotiated rates that we then piggybacked on for non-claim work. And also we tried to use alternative fee uh, arrangements and fixed fee arrangements wherever we could. Uh, Cam, um, can you discuss what you have done in terms of non-tech solutions for managing outside counsel? Yeah, I mean, I think the first and simplest thing that every new general counsel should do is, get, is uh, ensure that the, only the legal department hires and manages outside counsel. Um, every place I've arrived, there were some law firms that were hired by HR or a region or a business, and, um, and they were kind of running off on their own. And, and, you know, business people are wonderful. You know, they're the ones who make the money, but they don't know how to manage outside lawyers. They don't know how many depositions are required or uh, how much it ought to cost to do a uh, transaction. So the first thing is insist that only lawyers hire outside lawyers and only lawyers manage outside lawyers. Uh, I think a couple other things are um, to set, I think setting up a preferred firm program is smart. Um, I think, you know, the, the firms uh, uh, will be more happy to give you discounts if they view it as a long-term uh, arrangement. They're to be more comfortable with alternative fees. Um, we're gonna, again, we're gonna talk about technology, but if you have technology, you should know what a matter is going to cost at various points. So you can maybe negotiate at the beginning a, a fixed fee for, uh, for matters. And then as you say, uh, outside counsel guidelines are important. You, should, you can use technology to enforce them and they can automatically cut things uh, that, you, uh, that uh, the law firms aren't supposed to be uh, charging you for. And, and then, you know, finally, I think there's just no substitute for um, close, intrusive management of matters while they're handled by outside counsel. I think you, uh, you need to have some in-house lawyers to, uh, to watch what your outside lawyers are doing. Not that, not that outside law firms are trying to run up the bills, because I don't think they are, but their incentives are to investigate every issue and, and go through many drafts, and sometimes the marginal uh, benefit of doing that is not that great. So you should always be managing your outside counsel first. Oh, Christy, how about you? Yeah, I think my experience is similar. When I first became general counsel, the first thing I did was really try to get visibility into where we were spending money and why. Um, I did not have the same situation where uh, outside colleagues were, were hiring lawyers outside of the legal department, but we did have situations where I think we were spending money on things that didn't necessarily deserve that sort of outside counsel from a risk perspective. And so what we did was really a risk analysis of the areas where we need outside counsel and try to develop long-term partnerships. As, as Cam said, that's really important. People that work with us on a daily basis know our business so that there's not this ramp up curve every time you need outside counsel. And we look for experts that have subject matter expertise in the areas where we need outside counsel based on that assessment. And so sometimes we hire either a solo practitioner or a small boutique firm to deal with specialized kinds of issues as opposed to a big firm. And then we've had that relationship now for a number of years and that's really helped us manage costs and also ensure that we're getting the right expertise on particularly technical issues. Um, with respect to even litigation, we've looked to you know, smaller low cost providers sometimes We've moved a lot of work outside of New York. Apologies to those on the phone who are from New York. I'm from New York, we're headquartered in New York, but New York rates tend to be higher. So even sometimes when we're working with large firms, 
we're working with colleagues in different offices around the country, and that does reduce their rates quite a bit. So I'd say we you know, really looked at it on a holistic basis to try to figure out where are the areas that we can cut spending um, before you know, utilizing technology in order to ensure that we're spending money where we really need to be spending it as an organization. Uh, we have a question. I, I don't know if either of you have uh, worked with offshore or, or alternative providers to outside counsel. So whether temporary lawyer firms or um, other organizations. So have either of you had experience using them? So Cam, if you want to go first. Yeah, no, I, uh, at, at Medtronic, my uh, second GC job, we did, uh, I, I took a trip to India and it's actually a very uh, uh, amazing and, and inspiring site to go into one of these uh, places. Our, our provider was in outside Delhi and it's a, a modern looking office building with um, a lot of very young, eager lawyers that um, at the time were working for, uh, you know, for what was a great wage in India, but, you know, uh, nobody in New York would work for. So we did some of our, um, our, our patent prep and process work that way. Um, I, I, I think it worked pretty well for us, but that's really the only uh, time we've used uh, uh, offshore providers at any of my three jobs. Yeah, in my experience, um, we haven't used any offshore providers at Hain. Um, I recall in my prior company, we did use some offshore providers for some compliance related work just to, to do some background work and get records up to date, but we haven't used offshore work. We have worked with temporary agencies when we have a gap on the team. Um, and we've also worked with law firms on secondments where we have a particular uh, issue that we need to resolve in a short term where we have a short term need for more support. So we've done that on a flat fee secondment basis, which ends up being cost effective for us as a legal team. Right, so let's turn to technology. Um, Deloitte in a recent report says that legal departments are slow to modernize and that uh, they, they're the last areas to undergo operation and digital transformation. So hopefully we don't believe that really is true and, and we're getting there. Um, many legal departments have implemented e-billing and that's been around for a while. We had it when I was at Chubb. Um, Christy, I know uh, you have e-billing and that was important for you to get at your company. Why don't you talk a little bit about why that was important in your experience? Sure. So I think Cam mentioned earlier that outside counsel guidelines are really important for an organization. And we found those to be really helpful in terms of allowing us to set the, the parameters around what we'll pay for and not pay for as an organization. And what I found was that reviewing bills and reviewing bills you know, manually is a very time consuming task for our employees and our lawyers who are very busy with other things. And the utilization of an e-billing system, if you put in place uh, the parameters and the things that you'll pay for or not pay for, the e-billing system automatically rejects things that are outside the parameters and scope of what you've agreed to pay for with your outside counsel. And so just the automatic rejections in themselves, I felt like paid for the e-billing system for our team. And it also just gave us better visibility and transparency in terms of how you can sort and report on outside counsel spending. So for me, it was a very cost-effective way to get more data to support our legal budget and also understand you know, where we had discrepancies from our outside counsel uh, manual and also understand like which firms were um, perhaps uh, you know, billing more than others and where we could uh, uh, see additional savings going forward. So even though we're a very small team, I felt like it was money well spent and it's been a good return on our investment over the time that we've implemented it. And it's given us better visibility to manage our firms going forward. So it, it made sense, I think, just to use the technology to help with that process. Right now, Cam, you have both e-billing and you also use matter management. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, every legal department starts with e-billing just as the way to get the bills paid. But the great thing about e-billing when it's combined with a matter management system is uh, as you get a few years of data uh, in there, you, you really have very robust data to help manage individual matters, to decide which law firm to hire. Um, you know, you can see the average blended rates of all the law firms you use. Um, you can uh, 
uh, over time, figure out what a particular type of matter ought to cost so you can enter into fixed fee arrangements with firms and give them some confidence. Look, we've done 50 of these before and here's the range of what it's cost. So let's just agree that it's gonna be this price. I think it gives you just a lot of tools to manage things and even issues like uh, diversity. We, you know, we've asked our firms to uh, identify the gender and ethnicity of people in the system. So every year when we sit down with our firms for their year end evaluation, we can say that, you know, you're not really using diverse lawyers on our matters. And we, you know, we want you to, to try better next year to, to increase the, the level of diversity of the people working on our matters. So I found it to be a very powerful tool. Even, you know, I get a report every Monday that lists the top 10 matters for spending. And sometimes I'll see one that I hadn't really paid attention to. And I'll pick up, just pick up the phone and call the lawyer and say, what, you know, what, the, what does this matter? Suddenly we're spending a lot of money on it. And, uh, you know, when people know the general counsel is seeing that, they tend to manage matters carefully. Right, if they know you're watching, yep. Yeah. Um, shifting gears a bit, um, it, again, in focusing on efficiency for the department, uh, in sharing knowledge, both within your department and across the organization is really important. It helps not being always reinventing the wheel. Um, so having templates and guidelines that others in your department can use and for matters that are not um, high legal risk uh, or much legal risk, having ones that the business people can, can do. Like, so for example, NDAs, again, non-disclosure agreements, we had ones that the business people could just run with because it really wasn't very high risk. Uh, having training programs to help uh, educate the business about what the legal and compliance risks are also can be very important. Another related topic is contract management systems, which also can be very beneficial to the organization in terms of having uh, documents readily available for everyone. Um, so I'm going to bring up the next polling question, which is uh, getting a handle on the audience and their use of the various things that we've talked about. So my department has or is planning to implement the following, and it's multiple choice and check all that apply. E-billing system, matter management system, knowledge management, contract management, or none of the above. Um, so while we're waiting for that, Cam, uh, anything to add on knowledge management or contract management? Um, you know, we're, we're just kind of dipping our toes in this area, I would say, um, on... Um, uh, uh, we, we, we have also developed a tool that our business people can use for NDAs. That was one of the uh, low risk, low value uh, sorts of things that we identified early on. And, and our lawyers were spending a lot of time reviewing NDAs. They'd get it from a business person, they'd hand it to us and say, please review and, and, and you review it. So we have we've developed a tool now that we can generate an NDA or you can uh, test somebody else's NDA against it. And then uh, it'll pop it out to the lawyer for review at the end. Um, on contract management, we, as I said, we're just really getting started on that. We, we've uh, engaged a, a third party just to ask the question, what kind of contracts do we have in our company? And then we're gonna use that, that information to decide where we wanna go for, on a contract management basis. But, that's kind of the next frontier for us at ADM. Okay, okay. Can we have the polling results? Um, so the results are 53, 56% uh, have a contract management system. That's interesting. E-billing, 53%. Matter management, 37%. Knowledge management, 19 And none, 21%. So sort of interesting results there. Um, uh, legal operations is something that has been uh, much talked about of late, uh, and it's a focus of, of in increasing efficiency in the general counsel department. According to one recent survey, 75% uh, of departments with 50 or more lawyers uh, had at least one legal ops person. I know, Christy, you don't, we don't. have legal ops. Or we, I didn't have them at Chubb either. I know Cam, you have too. So can you just talk about your views on legal ops? Um, I, I found it to be extremely helpful. Um, 
Uh, we have a, 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 a great legal ops person at ADM and it, he was on his own for a long time. And so he, he has uh, established our technology, our matter management system. He has um, uh, attached modules to it. So we use it for everything from you know, matter management off and also to do uh, like our, our uh, disclosure questionnaires for our executives, the uh, quarterly, um, uh, the quarterly process for certifying the financials. So we built a lot of things into, into that and he's handled that. He does a lot of the rate negotiations with law firms so that they go to him and ask if they can get a rate increase and we do it on a person by person basis often. And so that, that takes that away from, from us lawyers, which is kind of nice. And it, you know, frankly, I, I just prefer the legal side of things. So I don't really like to get into the dirty world of negotiating rates with law firms. So it's been great for us. And if you can afford it, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, you know, I know some some legal departments have several people, but uh, we we found that two works fine for us. Right. You know, some organizations I think have have huge teams, so it really uh, varies across organizations. Um, let's. I know we're coming to the end of our time, so talk about probably the most valuable asset that legal departments have, which is our talent and the importance of talent development. Um, which is often very hard in legal departments because we generally are flat organizations with limited opportunities for advancement. Um, also time and money um, can be limited to uh, devote to, uh, to uh, the development of talent. Um, there are many things obviously that can be done to develop talent as simple as including people in meetings, uh, getting your staff on um, across departmental projects, including uh, strategic initiatives that the company may be working on, looking for opportunities for programs that may be offered internally or externally that the corporation may pay for that may not come out of your budget. And obviously there's always uh, finding mentors or coaches, uh, including uh, maybe the HR department offers that or using a company like Barker Gilmore and people like myself who do coaching as well. Um, Christy, can you just talk about suggestions you have for talent development? Sure, I mentioned one of them a little bit earlier. Um, when we look at what our department responsibilities are more cross-discipline, there are opportunities I think for people who are underutilized on the team to get experience working with somebody who has a larger project that may be outside of his or her discipline. And so we've been trying to do interdepart within our department cross-functional, cross-discipline projects more frequently. I also think, um, Maureen, as you mentioned, giving people an opportunity to engage with senior leaders in our organization. This has become a lot easier to do remotely. So with the use of Teams or Zoom, you're not paying for people to fly to meetings. You're asking them to log on to a, a Zoom meeting and you're giving them that visibility and exposure to people that they might not necessarily have the opportunity to speak with on a regular basis. So I think that's been really helpful from a professional development perspective, even quite frankly, with members of our board of directors, committee meetings, getting our team more engaged with um, our board and with members of um, you know, either outside council or members of our senior leadership team, because it's so easy to do without the expense of traveling, we've been really able to get people engaged more frequently. I think people management is really an important aspect of um, de developing talent as well and not something that people on the legal team typically get to do. And so what I've tried to do is ensure that to the extent we can make our department less flat, that we give people in the organization more opportunities for managing other colleagues. And sometimes even if it's not a direct line of reporting, even on a particular project, managing a group of people or a group of individuals supporting a project so that they also get the people aspect of it. I think, you know, lawyers don't typically know how to manage people and it's not something you grew up doing. So it's helpful for people to have those interactions and learn how to manage as part of being a member of the legal team. Great, uh, Cam, how about you? Uh, you know, I, when I got here, I, uh, I kind of set three strategic goals and one of them was talent because I think especially for legal departments, maybe more than almost any part of a company, we're just people and brains. So it's important to get the very best people. I think 
the first thing is, uh, it kind of goes without saying that communications is very important. We, we try to communicate uh, downwards, sideways, diagonally, upwards, uh, in every possible way. We have um, uh, quarterly global town halls in the department. Uh, we, uh, I have a weekly meeting with my direct reports where we talk about issues. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, we do things like, um, it, it's not called employee of the month, but we essentially uh, call out somebody every month in a, in a monthly meeting that we do with kind of a, an expanded leadership team. And it's amazing how, how well people react to being recognized. Um, we, tr we try to, um, uh, to do career development and succession planning so that everybody has goals, you know, short-term and long-term goals, and we try to help them fill their gaps in that area. Um, if there's somebody that's potentially my successor, I do try to get them board exposure. Um, uh, I think uh, diversity and inclusion is, is an important part of talent too. So uh, we're very proud, right? We think we're the most diverse part of our company and uh, we use uh, the Mansfield role when we interview people and been able to add a lot of really great talented colleagues. And, and then little things like pro bono, where we'll, you know, we tend to do pro bono as a group. We'll partner with a law firm, we'll go to a free legal clinic, maybe have a drink afterwards with the lawyers from the firm. So they're happy because they get to be with us. We're happy because we're with each other. And, uh, and you know, you can do, you feel good when you're doing good. So um, it's just a whole bunch of things, but it all starts with communication. Right, so let's see from our audience how they think their uh, companies are doing in terms of talent management. Uh, this is our last polling question. When it comes to talent management, I would give my law department a grade of excellent, good, but room for improvement, passable, but much more could be done, failure, non-existent, or not applicable. And while we're... Um, well, we're, do, well, we're waiting for those results. Uh, obviously, the pandemic, I think uh, both of you have alluded to uh, the impact of the pandemic on how things uh, get done and dealing with your talent. Interesting, Christy, you had raised the seat at the table in a way has become easier that you don't have to worry about actually the size of the room and having an extra chair to include people in a meeting. But if, if you both can talk about um, what you see the impact and going forward. Christy, I, I don't know if it's certain yet whether your company is gonna be fully back or not. Cam, it sounds like your company, you're fully back some places, not others. Um, how you see about handling uh, uh, talent development if you do have some people remote? Uh, you know, uh, it, it's funny that Christy mentions uh, 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 Zoom, Zoom and, and remote. Uh, meetings because we had had a, when I first got to the company, we did a big global meeting where we flew it in, you know, a uh, hundred people from around the, the world that hundred includes compliance and government relations, which also report to me. And our, our then president, now CEO came to speak to us. And I saw the look on his face when he looked out over the hundred people that we'd flown in from around the world. And I think he was just calculating the cost. And so we haven't done one since. <laughs> but um, we decided we're going to do it again this fall, uh, kind of a, to celebrate coming out of the pandemic, and we're going to do it virtually. And it, you know, won't cost us very much. Um, it, it'll be a, a really you know, good way to get us together. Um, I guess in terms of talent development, I, I actually uh, feel like, oddly enough, the pandemic, you know, might have it, it's helped expose me to more people face to face than. Than uh, even you know when I was just sitting in my office before. So um, I'll, I'll you know when I do see somebody now that we're in the office, I'll I'll say like when you know when did we last see each other? And he'll say it was February of 2020. And I'll say God, I feel like I've been talking to you all the time because we're talking by Zoom. So I don't think it's really affected our ability to stay in touch and uh, and develop people. I mean for onboarding, it's more difficult. But even for onboarding, you know, you can have somebody come to the company and have face-to-face -face meetings with our people all over the world in 100 countries much more easily than, you know, than you could have in the past where you, you kind of assume that you're going to send them there. And Christy? Yeah, I think my, my experience is similar. I think people feel very connected to the organization. Um, 
from a business perspective, it was important for our legal team to work with the company through the pandemic. And I think people feel that that role was very um, rewarding and trying to make sure that our consumers had products that they needed, trying to ensure that our employees stayed safe. So I do think, I agree with Cam, that there was good professional development throughout this experience. And Maureen, you mentioned, you know, what does the future hold? And I'm not really certain yet what our future will look like. I think the pandemic has taught us the value of flexibility in our organization. And I think that that's um, something that we'll have to factor in as we go forward, how important flexibility is to our colleagues and in terms of their retention going forward. I am a mom of two elementary school kids and the pandemic has been a real challenge for me professionally and personally. And so I know that in my future, there needs to be more flexibility and I, I will work just as hard and I appreciate the in-person interactions and I think that needs to be part of it. But I also now understand how well we can operate remotely as an organization. And so I do think that I'm more receptive and open to different possibilities of working styles and flexibility that I may not have been open to prior to the pandemic. Right. So I think both of you, and I've heard it from others as well, there have been a lot of learnings from this and it will be a new normal, whether you're back mostly full-time or not, there's a lot uh, that has we have learned through this process. And, if, if you had told me uh, on March 12, or whatever, whatever the day was, March 13th, uh, when we, you know, went home on the Friday and then didn't come back on the Monday, how well the technology would work and how quickly we could get used to this way of communicating, I wouldn't have believed you in a million years. So right. I, I just find it, it shows the resiliency of humans that we were able right. to do it. I think so we, were all, we were all just fortunate to have Zoom jump in just before this whole thing happened because Zoom really, and, and, and Teams obviously, but seemed like the timing couldn't have been better. We actually have to wrap it up. I, I have one question. We have a few questions that unfortunately are gonna go unanswered. We'll try to get to these questions um, and put them up on our website. But Christy, you were promoted from within and congratulations getting the GC spot of a multi-billion dollar company, which by the way, if anyone doesn't know her company, um, the Terra chips and the veggie chips, oh. which I'm a snack person, those come from her company. So the last two team. Yeah. Yes. So and it, back to my question is um, when you were before you were promoted, did you know you were a successor? And part two of that question is, what do you credit that you did get that promotion? What do you credit that to? Was it so? Well, I'll let you answer the question. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, you know, it was a difficult transition for me. I think I was probably put into the GC role before I personally felt ready for it. Um, we had discussions about it internally. I knew it was a possibility. I was not certain it would come to fruition, but I was excited about the opportunity and excited that someone would take a chance on me. And I feel like that's the way I've lived my career is kind of putting myself out there. I'm going to learn what I need to learn. I you know, am able to feel vulnerable. And so if there's areas where I don't have the expertise. I think some of it is acknowledging that I need support in those areas and making sure there's good visibility into where I'm going to need to augment my particular strengths but it was really a situation where I expressed an interest and I also, as I said, made, my, made it known that I was willing to try to take on the broader job. And I had great relationships with cross-functional colleagues and quite frankly, our board of directors. And it was really helpful in having all that support for my promotion. So I encourage folks on the phone that you know, may not feel ready for it to try and always you know, put yourself out there and also just you know, accept that there's always going to be things that you don't know. I think the pandemic is a great example of that. You know, before the pandemic, none of us really knew how to manage a global pandemic. And now we've all learned that expertise as we go. So I think it's just about, you know, being vulnerable, but being able to have the confidence and, and know that you'll have the support you need in, in taking that next step. Hmm, Every great. time you're a GC for the first time, it's total imposter syndrome. You feel like yep. you, don't, you can't possibly know enough to do the job. You just have to play the doctor on TV, I guess. Right. Well, I, I learned quickly why they call it general counsel, because yeah. you're meant to cover everything, and it's like there's no way I could possibly know everything. Yeah, fa faking it is really helpful. Right. Faking it until you make it. Right. And, and Kim, actually, a question for you, too, when it comes to succession planning at a large company is one, do the people inside your law department, have they actually been tagged as potential successors? And the one comment you made is, 
which I think oh, I couldn't agree more is getting them more exposure to the board is a, a great way to go. And many times the corporate lawyers feel that they have an edge because they're doing corporate secretarial or helping with the SEC disclosure. So they get involved with some of the board from that standpoint. Well, where do you get your teams besides from a corporate standpoint? Where do you get them that board exposure? Uh, you know, um, uh, my my head of litigation has also runs our uh, our uh, captive insurance company, so he has to report annually uh, on that, and and will come and um, sometimes uh, join me for a report on litigation. Um, uh, our business unit general counsels typically don't go before the board, but I, I certainly try to give all my lawyers. Um, visibility before the board, even if it's just me talking about, about their role in a matter. What I thought was interesting, John, is both Christy and Cam's background is litigation. Yeah. Well, a lot of times people will say, oh, it's, it's corporate. Um, but, um, you know, and obviously Cam's career has taken them into a lot of different areas, et cetera. But it, I think it's not true that it's always from corporate and only if you're in corporate that you would be general counsel. I think it depends upon the company uh, and what the needs of the organization are. Yeah, we have living proof right here today. Right. So it, with that said, we're going to wrap things up. Again, if you would check out our, um, our website, we'll give a notice, but you can check back and see um, this will be live or re the recording will be up on our site. Um, if anyone has any specific questions for either Maureen or Christy or Cam, feel free to send them our way. We'll get some answers back to you. Um, again, we hope we see everybody on the 16th. And if anyone needs any assistance either way from coaching and advising or from an executive search standpoint, whether you're looking for something new or you're looking to hire someone new, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you again to Christy and Cam and Maureen putting together a great program today. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Bye.